Chapter Twenty Seven of the Story of a New Zealand River by Jane Mander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Seven. Two nights later, as David Bruce was walking alone towards his shanty from the store, he was arrested by a light shining from the dining room of Tom Roland's house. He could not have told exactly why he stopped, for it was not unusual for a light to be there even at midnight. He speculated about it, knowing the boss was away and that no one was ill. Suspecting why it still burned, he turned towards it with a sigh. He walked in by the back door, unannounced, and as he expected, he found Alice sitting up alone. One glance at her face told him why she waited. You are sitting up for her, he said. She resented the reproach in his tone. David, I cannot bear it any longer. I must speak. She stays out later and later every night. He stood before her, making no attempt to sit down. "'Do you think speaking to her will stop that?' he asked wearily. "'Yes, she will have to listen to me. I have something to say that will make her listen.' For once he missed the significance of her positive tone. "'She will listen, my dear. She will listen courteously enough. She will tell you she understands your feeling and your point of view. And you know what she will do after that, don't you?' She looked up at him and away again. He saw that her lips were set in an agony of determination, and that she was unmoved. She will do exactly what she wants to do, he went on quietly. She dropped her face into her hands. She will not, David, not after I have talked to her. Oh, my dear girl, the impatience in his tone stung her. Don't you know yet that talking to people of her type does no good? It would be all right for Betty and Mabel. They would be scared off anything at the first breath of criticism. You would have to save them because in the end they would want to be saved. But do you think people like Asia and Ross are going to allow anyone to regulate their feelings for them? For God's sake, do see it before it is too late. As he spoke, her lips trembled and tears welled up in her eyes. It hurt him to see that her recent color was almost gone. It hurt him to know that she was still her own enemy. He determined to try once more to get her to see that she was not responsible for the sins of the world. Leaning down, he pulled her up to face him. Come out with me he said softly. Get a cloak, and be quick. It would be a pity for her to find us here. Mechanically she found a wrap, and followed him outside. He led the way along the path towards his shanty. It's all right, he said, sensing her misgivings. No one will see us, and no one will come. She stood on the porch while he found and lit his lamp. Then he set his most comfortable chair so that the light would fall behind her. Nervous, because she knew she was going to hear something unpleasant, she sat down stiffly, keeping her wrap about her shoulders. The lamplight glowed dully upon metal things in the room, a tobacco jar, brass candlesticks, gilt picture frames. Bruce made no pretense of running elegant bachelor quarters. His shanty was a large unpapered room, lined with oiled boards, the ceiling showing the rafters. It had an open fireplace at one end, and rugs of no particular kind upon the floor. He had one bunk, rugged, and cushioned like a lounge several chairs, rough book and other shelves, a doctor's cabinet, and three tables. On two of the tables, and on many of the shelves, was spread a strange assortment of objects, good and bad. The good had been gifts from Alice, Asia, and Mrs. Brayton. The bad, the sentimental offerings of numerous patients. The room had an extraordinary atmosphere of comfort. Asia had always declared it was the friendliest room she had ever seen, that it had the peace of a confessional and the welcome of a wayside inn. The only door which faced the green hill and was shaded by a small porch was always open night and day, whatever the season or the weather, and the only things, as far as Bruce knew, that had entered with designs upon his property were dogs, cats, and a calf. Alice had long been familiar with every detail of it by day, but pursuing her policy of extreme discretion, she had never visited him alone at night. Her doing so now had a suggestion of adventure that affected her, making her still more nervous and complicating the sources of her mental dislocation. Bruce drew a chair near to her, putting his pipe and tobacco on the table within reach. The something about his leisureliness that had always fascinated her helped now to still the jump of her nerves. The years had deepened the lines of suppression on Bruce's face, and had streaked his black hair with grey but they had not dulled the humorous gleam of his brown eyes or put even a suggestion of age into the easy movements of his limbs. Six years before this he had finally beaten out the periodical craving for whiskey, 
and though that battle for the complete possession of his soul had not left him scatheless it had added to the power of his attractions and to his ability to make the most of them the triumph of his life had been his management of his friendship with alice roland he knew she had never realized to what extent he had controlled it he had been amazed at the way in which she had finally settled down to it as something that would never change he had wondered that she could go on living with tom roland as she had for years without open signs of revolt he never had been quite able to understand her extraordinary acceptance of life as other people arranged it her submission to her husband her lack of fighting quality of a sense of adventure on the other hand he had never ceased to be astonished at her powers of endurance her infinite capacity for silent suffering he knew that her ill health had been the chief agent in cultivating her lack of initiative and her pitiful desire for peace and there had always been something he could not get at in her it piqued his curiosity again and again he knew that though she had altered much in the last few years she was not half as broad-minded as she with a pleasant vanity had supposed herself to be and he felt sadly as he looked at her now that in spite of all that he had tried to do for her she was ill prepared to meet the facts of life that were now about to descend upon her accustomed as he was to introducing the facts of life to unsuspecting people he could never do it without a full appreciation of the pain and disruption it caused with a short appealing look at her he dropped his head into his hands and stared at a frayed piece near the corner of his rug she looked apprehensively at him fearing now that he was withholding some bad news what is it david you are worrying about them too i know it but she saw she was mistaken when he raised his face i am not i see no reason for worrying about them it's you i'm thinking about me david she returned his quiet look with one of grieved astonishment yes you i really don't know anyone else that i should be worrying about at present she drew herself up a little pushing back her cloak do you mean to say david that you don't believe those two are in any danger even if they were i should not be worrying about them why worry about people who will never worry about themselves it's silly he turned to the table and deliberately filled his pipe and lit it though she scarcely criticized him alice thought his action seemed heartless her eyes hardened david i don't expect you to feel about this as i do but i did think you would understand why i feel and that you would help her voice broke in spite of her effort to keep it steady he melted at once and leaning forward took her hands before he spoke he straightened out a piece of lace on her throat that had been crumpled under her cloak he noticed for the first time that she was wearing a violet dress he liked and that she had evidently expected him to dinner you believe they are in danger he began gently in danger of what you know david my dear i don't know what you think the danger is do you mean that they may live together or that they may be suspected or found out just what do you mean by the danger david if they do anything they will be found out he continued to look at her with solemn gentleness supposing you knew for certain that they would not be found out would you worry about what they did her eyes fell away from his would you he repeated it's no use asking me that question she said impatiently the two things go together they cannot go on doing anything and not be found out do you know what they intend to do have they told you he did not mean to hurt her by the question it brought home to her the fact that she was probably the last person they would ever tell as he saw her lips tremble he squeezed her hands my dear i did not mean that to hurt but you know you have nothing to go on but suspicions now you may as well know what you really do have to face i know for they have told me she sat very still while he talked on finding that in spite of what he said she was relieved to have it put plainly so that she could see what it meant the thing they have to face is that ross may never be able to get his divorce unless his wife applies for it he cannot at present he left her he keeps her she is willing to live with him unless she goes mad dies or lives with some man he will not be free ross and asia are in love he lives now as a single man a useless hysterical and selfish woman is the only thing between them and the conventions they have a chance here that may never come to them again in life to love each other in freedom lynn you and i will know tom will suspect 
no one else will ever know unless we tell them and none of us will ever tell them in the autumn they will go to sydney not by the same boat but she will go a month or so after him they will not attempt to live openly together they will work together he plans to make her his secretary they will not be reckless or yell defiance at the world they will know how to keep away from scandal they both have fine and loyal friends who will cover up their tracks as time goes on their friendship will be known and its possibilities suspected but they will win the world to believe in their friendship and to shut its eyes as to what may happen between them in private people like them can do that today it can be done in every city there are several cases in auckland you have met one pair often at the hardings now i want you to see at once that you cannot stop one bit of all this there are even people whom you like who would blame you if you tried to not that that would stop you but if you will take my advice you will shut your eyes and see nothing until you are told and then you will reserve your judgment he clasped his hands over hers as he stopped and sitting up again lit his pipe and puffed slowly alice sat very still looking away from him she began to repeat to herself the things he had said so that she would remember them for all consideration afterwards she did not cry now that she knew the worst or feel like crying she did not feel as wretched as she had expected to feel she felt more than anything else a buzz and confusion of conflicting emotions and opinions that made her head spin she sat clenching her hands in the effort to get some order into her thoughts things she wanted to know got mixed up with things she was trying to think at last something in the peace of the room and the stillness of the night and the comfortable sight of david bruce smoking soothed her brain when she turned to him she was ready with the questions do you think they are right david the absence of hostility in her voice pleased him i don't know that i have to decide that they think they are right if we judge them at all we must judge them by that he saw that for the time being she had forgotten her fears and that something else was on her mind don't you think she will be any different if she lives with him he looked curiously into her questioning eyes in which there was more than a grain of unbelief my dear do you really believe that a girl is branded in some mysterious way if she has relations with a man on the prehistoric side of the marriage ceremony do you think the failure to repeat a few words alters cells it alters minds david oh no it's the attitude of other people towards the action that affects your mind when it is affected there is nothing in the action itself that does it you would not think any differently of her david you would respect her just the same oh god he sat up suddenly you have known me for fifteen years and you ask that question but she continued her questions you would marry a woman who had lived with a man certainly if i loved her it would make no difference at all i can't imagine why you ask you know how i feel about these things i know how you have talked when we have read books she said slowly i see and you thought i was only talking he leaned towards her again well i wasn't and nothing that asia could do with ross could affect my opinion of her do you understand that now he looked almost resentful he could not understand her doubt yes she answered and looking down she seemed to him to be facing some new difficulty he guessed rightly what it might be have you remembered that there might be a child david she could not keep solemnity out of her voice for that ready for her he answered at once quietly of course but that will be provided for you know people of their type don't have children today unless they want them although she had heard this hinted at before it came to her with the force of a shock now that it was mentioned in connection with a child of hers my dear girl this comes as a shock to you because you don't know human beings you have never really wanted to know them you have shirked knowing them you have divided them up into the good and the bad you have put the people you liked with the good and the people you did not like with the bad you have said to yourself there are certain things the good will never do certain things the bad are likely to do you have thought human beings were all of a piece because you have classed me with the good you would not believe i could do things you thought wrong as a matter of fact i have done many things you would think infamous you do not know asia you do not know how she thinks or what she would do or what she knows she knows more of life than you ever did or ever will you can't tell her anything she doesn't know it may be a stale joke to say that the daughters of today could educate their mothers but it is also a great truth you do not know one half of the things that have happened round you 
in this little place you did not want to know so we all formed a conspiracy to keep everything unpleasant away from you you have had troubles enough of your own god knows but you have let them shut you up my dear that is the pity now if you will only bear the truth you have the chance to help give up judging where you don't know it's so useless as she listened to him a conviction of failure the most numbing and despairful she had ever known swept over her remembering it afterwards she wondered if it was under such stress of feeling that people committed suicide when he saw tears of dumb misery coming to her eyes he pushed his chair beside hers threw his arm around her shoulder and began to comfort her talking brokenly don't worry about it now dear leave the past alone and begin again see asia and ross as they are two fine young things who want to go through fire and water for each other let them whatever happens to them they won't whine or upset the world they may be hurt they are bound to be hurt whatever they do courageous and thoughtful people are always hurt no one can stop that any sort of life hurts them but they won't be broken that is the great thing i know it is hard to realize but things have changed you keep thinking of england as you and i knew it you think they will be damned but they will not out there they will only be suspected people will wonder that's all she became amazed as he went on that he seemed to have no conviction about their action there was nothing in his words to show that he had any regard for standards that he recognized moral laws or the necessity for social safeguards and yet she knew that his life had belied the lax philosophy that a chance listener would have inferred from his speech she dare not listen to his heresy it would have made of her whole life too ghastly a sacrifice to be contemplated david she burst out passionately i don't care what you say there are laws there ought to be laws where would it end i believe we ought to make sacrifices to keep them i believe the finest people do you have yourself you know you have there are ideals i must believe asia right or wrong wise or unwise i can't let it go at just leaving them alone i can't be indifferent people may be more charitable i suppose they are but it can't alter my feeling my dear i know that he turned and faced her i know you can't help feeling i'm feeling about it myself i think it is a pity they have to compromise with life that way but i don't see that it is any worse a compromise than than your marriage for example her eyes fell in swift confusion you see my dear he went on gently there are things asia could say to you if you would begin to talk to her i can't believe that you don't see it and what you ever thought you could say that would convince her i don't know as she threw her head up suddenly he saw that words had been stopped on the tip of her tongue and that she was startled that she had nearly let them slip what were you going to say he asked with curiosity he saw fear and indecision in her eyes he leaned forward looking hard at her do you mean to tell me that there is anything that you are afraid to say to me oh david she threw out her hands to him there is something i have never told you i don't know why i have wanted to but i was afraid it it might make a difference but now i know it won't oh david it won't will it oh do you have to ask me that even then she looked half fearfully at him as she answered when i was eighteen i did as she is going to do and she is the child what he cried out that that his voice broke off as if he had suddenly found himself alone at the same time he looked at her as if she had just dropped through the ceiling searching his eyes for every shade of expression she could see nothing but his incredulous amazement you kept that for me he stammered all all those years you were afraid to tell me that's what it was and you were afraid to tell me and it was god now i see it was that he ended as if he were again talking to himself curiously calm now that she had told him alice saw that her confession had been also an explanation and that it seemed to answer some riddle that had long puzzled him if there had been any thought in her mind of amazing him any desire to give him the shock of his life she would have had a sense of flattering success but all she felt in the moment following his words was that his opinion of her was really not lowered and that he was hurt because she had never told him before you were afraid to tell me he began again oh david she caught one of his hands everything else swept out of her mind by that look of positive pain 
don't think it was that i i often wanted to tell you i know it would have helped but but oh i don't know but do understand if you were a woman you would never tell that you have never told anyone i i did tell mrs brayton never anyone else oh david don't look like that it wasn't that i didn't trust you oh yes it was he shook his head sadly and i confessed to you once but that was quite a different thing she pleaded was it well all right but i have always prided myself on the fact that nobody would ever hide anything from me i see it was a delusion and i thought i hadn't any his head dropped into his hands alice stared at him she could not believe that he was thinking more of that than of the thing she had told him she sat tense in her chair her hands clasped on her knee unable to think seeing as in a dream his stooping form before her and his hands pressed into his face but david bruce's thoughts had swiftly turned from the discovery of the unsuspected delusion to other aspects of the thing he had heard in a flash he saw that her whole life had been a reaction from the pitiful mistake of her youth he saw that the years had been one long penance one determined sacrifice one everlasting fear of being found out one long support of the respectabilities all the more fierce because she had suffered so much from her own failure to observe them he saw now why she had so carefully guarded her reserves why she had been afraid to open out why she had fought against the insinuating approach of confidences why she had shut down again and again on discussions that might bring her near to an expression of opinion on moral lapses he guessed now that her marriage had been an escape to begin with and afterwards a cross to be borne a duty to be observed at any cost her early attitude to himself was now explained it was all as clear to him as daylight he realized too in those first minutes that she would see this repeating of history with asia as a nemesis an inevitable result of her own action and seesawing back and forth in these flashes of review and realization were moments of astonishment that he had not seen it before that she had been strong enough to keep it from him because his natural responses were at first judicial it was a few minutes before the facts became emotionalized in his mind then the tragedy of the sacrifice and the waste sickened and enraged him with a groan he sat up to find alice's eyes devouring his face uneasily impulsively he threw out his arms to her and with a look that spread reverence about her like a soft and gracious garment he dropped on his knees and buried his face in her lap they sat like that for some time before he raised his face can you tell me about it dear he asked gently yes i can now david her eyes shone at him getting up again he put his arms about her at intervals while she talked his hands closed and relaxed upon her arms but he said nothing though she hardly looked at him she never for a moment found it difficult to go on with her story i didn't know anything david no one had ever told me my mother was dead i had lived a lot to myself and i always felt so much and i read silly romances till i longed for a husband we were so shut up my father wouldn't let us see men and i don't know what was the matter with me i suppose it was too much sex but i craved to be engaged and married i supposed it was wrong and i tried to fight it but it was no use and when i was eighteen i met the man he was older than i he was thirty and he was the handsomest man who had ever been seen in our town oh it was the same old story david i attracted him and that made me infatuated and when my father forbade him to call we met on the sly he said we were engaged and he promised to marry me and so it happened only for two weeks david and then i got frightened and one night he did not come he went away and never came again and then then i found i was going to have a child she moved a little in her chair and went on i nearly died of horror i don't know now how i went through it i couldn't commit suicide i was religious i felt i had to think of the child that saved me i took what money i had and came out to australia my father did not even say good-bye to me i never saw him after he found out one brother helped me but none of them ever wrote to me asia was born in sydney and i hadn't a ring or anything so people guessed but one woman good kind soul bought me a wedding ring and made me widow's clothes and told me to go to new zealand as a widow and never to tell anybody and to marry if i got the chance for the sake of the child 
as she thought she heard him groan she paused and turned her face but he was staring ahead and made no move to look at her it was the wrong done to the child that obsessed me it nearly drove me mad i felt i had to save her i would have told any lies to save her i knew i was damned anyway so i came to christchurch with my piano and hardly any money i couldn't stand the cold and i wasn't getting on and one day i remember every bit of it it was snowing and i was two miles from my room with asia i had been in a shop and i lost my purse i didn't find it out until i got outside i went back but no one had seen it that was the last straw it had nearly all my money i just sat down on a chair and cried you see what a coward i was i felt i would die and the child too that nothing could save us her voice broke a little but she recovered it and went on tom roland was in that shop and he saw me and came up he looked so kind and somehow i knew he was honest he offered to lend me money and he called a cab and took me home i don't know how it was but he got part of my story he dominated me i was so helpless he told me he was to be there only a week and he urged me to come north to auckland where he knew people he said he would get me pupils and he left fifty pounds with me i couldn't stop him i prayed about it till i was sick but i couldn't see anything else to do so i came and he started me and then he said he wanted to marry me he had never touched me before i didn't know that he cared she paused again and sat very still for a while she felt bruce's fingers grip into the flesh of her shoulder but still he said nothing he said he cared david he seemed to but i i did not love him i told him i liked him he said that was enough that he could make me love him and i knew he was liked i knew he was the sort of man that would get on and there was asia oh david and i knew i would never get on i had belonged to a family that made parasites of its women no woman in it had ever earned her living i could not face poverty i had no commercial sense i did not know how to manage people i could not advertise myself i thought that was vulgar i could not stand alone he dominated me and i thought it was the best thing for the child so i married him he took me in good faith i was the attractive and respectable woman he wanted for his wife his belief in me made me more afraid than ever i felt i had to be his slave because i had deceived him and i did want peace but there was no peace i got so little sleep he was irritable he hated crying children and he was so awfully alive he always dominated me i grew so afraid of him i could never manage him you know how it was and it was just as bad as it could be when we came here i did not see how i could live shut up with him and then you turning she saw that his face was set in lines of desperation i saw that you would dominate me too if ever i let you it terrified me when i saw that i could love you i don't know what the matter was with me i could not stop myself caring i tried but i couldn't and i knew if you did anything i was afraid of myself and i thought he would find out and kill us or make scenes and so i was afraid of you david afraid of you as she spoke he sprang out of his chair with a groan the cool detachment of her voice had maddened him to the point where he could not hear another word the tragedy that had long since wrecked its worse upon her and was now only an ache in her memory had become to him through the quiet telling of it vivified into a present intolerable wrong one of his rare sudden rages seized him shaking he strode to the door hell and damnation god in heaven damn you the words ground out ended in an indescribable sound as he clenched his fists at something out in the night then he seemed to crumple up as he put out his hands to hold on to the door after a suspensive moment alice saw what was the matter with him and her one thought was to minimize it as a cause for suffering oh david it's all over now it does not matter it does matter he shouted swinging round it will always matter what ghastly waste what stupid sacrifice god it makes me sick to think of it sick sick staggering forward as he spoke he tumbled onto his bed and lay face downwards alice got up from her chair and stood looking uncertainly at him she had seen him impatient even angry she had seen him hurt but never before had she seen his control really broken when she saw his body shake and heard something that sounded like a sob she felt miserably helpless oh david don't cry she choked falling onto her knees beside him 
and gathering his head in her arms. But she could not stop him, and there had been nothing in that two weeks of anxiety, fear, and impotent anger, half so disrupting to her as his terrible sobbing, for he cried like a beaten man. It was hard for her to understand that he suffered more in the sorrows of others than he did in his own, that he hated cruelty and injustice in the abstract, as most people hate insults and injuries to themselves. She could not understand why her story had moved him so. He had known her life at the bay, she thought, and she had managed to live, often comfortably for periods in which she had gathered strength to go on. It had not been all intolerable, or she could never have lived. She knew as well as he did that her life had been a sacrifice and a waste, but she had known it for so long that the thought of it had ceased to rouse in her more than a dull despair. Lately she had sought to forget it, to shut it out of her consciousness, and she had succeeded even better than she had hoped until the present blow had revived it all for her. But even then, and in the telling of it, it had seemed more like a dream than a reality. Stupidly at first she tried to comfort Bruce, and then seeing that she could not, she broke down herself. They cried together like two heartbroken children, till, recovering himself, he drew himself up on his bunk, pulled her beside him, and sat still with his arms about her. For some time they did not attempt to speak. Suffering a physical reaction, he did not even try to think. When at last she turned to him, ready to talk, she woke him out of his rare apathy. Don't think about it any more, David. It's all over now. It doesn't hurt me any more. He stared stupidly at her, realizing she was trying to comfort him. You see now why I feel about Asia, she went on in a low voice. He roused himself. Oh, my dear, don't talk about them any more tonight. Let them alone. Let them alone. I can't talk about them or anything. His head dropped upon her shoulder as if he were a tired child. She soon realized her own weariness as she sat half propping him, watching moths crowd about his lamp. Mechanically she followed the agitated circles of one much larger than the rest, till it dashed itself against the globe and fell blistered and maimed upon the table, where it plunged up and down in tortured throes. The sounds of its thuds attracted Bruce's attention. He could not bear the sight of its frantic agony. He got up and crushed it under his ash tray. The action helped him. When he turned to Alice, he saw her for the first time for half an hour. Something in his eyes, as he looked down at her, brought her to her feet. They stood for a minute looking at each other. Then he threw out his arm and threw her against him, and began to kiss her as he had not dared to kiss her for a long time. Although he did it quietly and deliberately, something about it arrested her. In his own time he stood away from her, and she saw how utterly worn out he looked. I'd better go home, David. Yes. He saw how white she was. We can't talk any more tonight. But there was something she felt she must say. David, I wish now I'd told you, but I did want you to go on loving me, and I was afraid. I couldn't be sure. There are so few people like you. And it makes no difference. As if to be doubly sure, she searched his eyes again. No difference whatever, he answered gently. The peace of that certainty was the peace of absolution. It was not till they were out upon the path that she remembered how much the night had revealed. As if he saw, he spoke about it. Don't do anything about Asia, I mean, till you've seen me again, will you? he asked. All right, David. At the front gate he put his arms round her again. I can't tell you what I feel about it, your story. I could never speak calmly about it. God, it won't bear thinking about. I've got to forget it. Good night. I'll be here all day tomorrow. I'll see you in the evening. Think about what I said, about Asia and Ross, because your life was spoiled. You don't have to spoil theirs. Good night. Kissing her on the forehead, he turned away at once and stumbled homewards. End of chapter 27「Twenty Eight of the Story of a New Zealand River by Jane Mander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Eight. Refusing to think any more that night, Alice dropped into a heavy sleep from which she was startled only by Asia's knock and the usual question as to whether she would get up or have her breakfast in bed. As the door was not opened, she merely roused herself sufficiently to say she would have it in her room. Then she sank back to doze for some minutes before she remembered that something had happened. 
at first she could not think what it was she puzzled over scraps of sentences that danced about in her memory like a spot of light reflected on a wall from a moving mirror then her mind cleared suddenly and she saw herself back in bruce's room and remembered that she had told him her story and that it made no difference to him she was not as surprised at this as she might have been it seemed now as if she had always known that she would tell him and that he would understand it was other things in the evening that crowded upon her attention that stung her to wide awakeness she knew she had not dreamt them she knew they were true she told herself she had to decide what she was going to do about them she stared at her wall as if she saw there in letters of fire that asia was going away with alan ross and that nothing could stop her as if she saw there in burning words the reason why she of all people was the one least able to help or prevent them good morning mother how do you feel as the door opened wide alice jumped and stared at the familiar face and form that hid a mind so much stranger to her she could hardly believe that the greeting and the tone were the same ones that she had heard with little variation all down the years oh she exclaimed stupidly startled into temporization i must have dozed again her head dropped back and she pretended to be very sleepy as in a dream she watched asia fix the blinds regulate the windows and bring the breakfast table to her bedside nothing could have looked more innocent of defiance to the traditions than she did she was dressed in the simplest of blue gingham frocks her hair piled loosely on her head if she felt uncertainty or anxiety she was clever enough not to show it so far sleeplessness had left no telling marks upon her she looked as fresh as the early morning as sweet as an ocean wind as sure of herself as a river running swiftly to the sea seeing her now in the light of her chosen future her mother could only feel that she was too unreal to be true as she finished settling the breakfast table asia smiled into her mother's eyes with a studied pleasantness she knew her mother had not slept well but she ignored the fact as one of those she had made up her mind to ignore she thought she knew exactly what her mother's attitude was and would be she felt words on either side would be utterly useless she hoped they would get through the summer on the mutual understanding that there was nothing to be said and she meant if her mother went along without an open break to talk to her some time later when they might both speak more calmly with so much of the experience behind them she thought she knew what it would mean to her mother but with the terrible ruthlessness of youth combined with her own hard common sense she told herself that her mother had had her chance and that age had no business to cripple the impulses and desires and plans of youth she knew that so far her mother had had nothing but suspicions to go upon she had learned from david bruce the night before that he had till then said nothing and she had supposed he would go on saying nothing although she had not asked him to alice had seen for some time that asia was managing her sometimes it had amused her sometimes it had hurt she had made up her mind several times that she would not let it go on but she had always succumbed weakly in the end feeling that for the sake of peace she might as well that it didn't matter now she saw that it might be the easiest way out of this crisis that if she let herself be managed they might avoid the break that she dreaded as much as asia did she could not smile back at her but looked past her inquiringly at the dressing jacket hanging over the back of the chair it's going to be a hot day mother you'd better not work in the garden said asia as she reached for it oh very well don't you want to sit up mechanically alice drew herself off the pillows while asia helped her into the negligee now don't let your coffee get cold mother and with that she was gone closing the door behind her don't work in the garden mother don't let your coffee get cold the words rang on in alice's ears with the dominant insistence of drumbeats on a march alice had often been comforted by these expressions which seemed to her an outward and visible sign of an inward care that she loved to think her children felt for her but now she wondered how much it meant to asia to say them whether it mattered at all she did let her coffee get cold while she drifted into another conviction of failure so devastating that she would gladly have died as she laid there in bed nothing but the fear that asia might come in drove her finally to choke down as much as she could in dismay she saw that there were four slices of toast when she could eat only one as if she had been destroying criminal evidence she wrapped up the other slices in some paper and hid them in a bureau drawer till she could dispose of them later she dressed slowly and absent-mindedly doing things in the wrong order and fumbling as if she were recovering from an illness after she had aired and made her bed 
and tidied up her room she went out to sit in her veranda rocker on the shady side of the house outside her window the day was not yet far enough advanced for the heat to be uncomfortable and a morning freshness still lingered above the river which lay without a ripple below her the scent of roses and honeysuckle filled the air about her plants and creepers grew and trailed about the veranda posts so that she looked through a leafy frame away over the lowlands into the western haze the noises from the mill the eternal reminder of the preeminence of her husband's brains the embodiment of his vitality and his success seemed to beat upon her ears with a more than usual arrogant aggressiveness for a long time she felt too crushed to face or analyze the thing that had beaten her all she could feel was that she was beaten by degrees she thought backwards over her life but not in any sort of order or association or logical connection and out of scrappy scenes she pieced an arraignment of herself and some kind of explanation for her failure she was staggered to realize how little she knew of the people with whom she had lived you do not know human beings bruce had said now that she was alive to this fact she began to remember things that strengthened it there flashed among others into her memory the story of a girl who had been found dead in a gully at the foot of Pukicaroro some years before the case had come before harold brayton and mrs brayton had hinted to her what the girl had died of but the story had been told her only in a guarded way she had never taken in the full force of it she had learned nothing from it she saw now that owing to her own attitude stories had always been told her in a guarded way the decent way she supposed she wondered if there was any tragedy going on now under her unseeing eyes you do not know one half of what has happened around you in this little place bruce had said she began to review her life in its relation to the village about the bay she had seen it all grow out of the rushes and the coarse grass she had seen every plot staked out she had marked the progress from day to day of every little home the planting of the house blocks the rapid running up of the frames the weatherboarding the roofing then she had watched for the families to come in as it had been her duty to call on them she had always done so early in the first week making herself as pleasant as she could especially to the brides and bridegrooms for whom she always felt an absurd sympathy as if they were heading for some sorrow which she saw and they did not as tom roland had prospered her sphere of benevolence had enlarged the presents she took to the new babies became more ostentatious she sent cakes and presents at christmas time to the poorer families when the bay school opened she became its patron she went to the picnics and concerts and gave out the prizes with nervous little speeches she had been the lady bountiful of the village she had been pleased to feel that she had entered into the lives of these people that she had meant something to them in the way of an influence toward refinement and righteousness she had liked to know that she was welcome in every house that the children ran to meet her that chairs were specially dusted for her to sit upon but now she saw that she had known only one side of these people the side that mattered least the party manner side she had prided herself that people always behaved in her presence that they took no liberties with her she saw now that this meant that no one had ever come to her with a story of sin and shame that no one had ever come to her with a cry help me hot upon trembling lips no one had ever come to her for the understanding that in desperate moments saves souls from despair she saw that every one had lied to her and she saw why she saw that every one had conspired to shield her and she saw why she saw that because she had shut herself off from life life had closed its gates to her and she saw that she did not have to flee from life because life had maimed her that she should have done as david bruce had done that she should have reached out to it taken it with both hands and used it slow tears ran unheeded down her cheeks as she saw that the scheme of respectability that she had preserved in the face of cruel odds was all wrong that she had labored for twenty years to build something that had been no real use to anybody except perhaps as a comforting delusion to herself that it had been merely a pleasant fiction to her and that others had passed it by because it had touched their lives only in the lightest moments she wondered afterwards how she managed to face lunch fortunately for both her and asia mabel and the children always came home from the bay school and in the fuss of looking after them and getting them off again in time strange silences and forced conversations were eliminated alice lay down afterwards for an hour or two and then drawing her chair to the east side she sat down to continue her investigation 
she was determined to see herself now as she was she had thought she had become emancipated from much of her past she had come home from the place stirred about many things her mind a ferment about the intellectual ascent the special case individual rights but her emotional reaction to the situation she had found in her own home had plunged her back into the arguments of puritanism to fixed principles to inevitabilities to all the bogies that follow in the train of fear and prejudice the more she thought about it the more she craved to get away from the people she had failed she wondered how she could face them again with the full truth of her own futility crushing her she asked herself what she meant to the members of her own family would betty or mabel come to her with their secret thoughts physically they were women now how did they feel about it she did not know she had told them one or two essential facts she suspected asia had added to their knowledge but what they realized of life she had no idea what was she to bunty a healthy roistering boy at the intolerable age when everything feminine was beneath his notice when a mother was the dragon who ordered him to wash his face clean his boots and go to bed at unkind hours would he come to her when life began to puzzle him what was she to elsie a sweet and gentle child who played much alone and never gave anybody any trouble did she see her mother as a remote personage who was not to be bothered as somebody who occasionally graciously consented to play with her but who could never play her way she remembered the child had been taught by asia and the girls not to trouble her mother with her childish griefs what was she now to her husband an attractive figurehead for the respectable family structure that in his own way he seemed to value a woman admired by people whose education and position he was bound to respect because he knew they ran the world if she meant any more to him than this she did not know what was she to asia she knew that asia loved her that she recognized the bond and that she always would she knew asia valued her powers of endurance she knew they were knit together by a common experience that meant inexpressible things to both of them but what did she really mean to-day to the girl whom yesterday she thought she knew and to-day saw that she had never known and perhaps would never know what had she ever done for asia except question every new move she made shake her head with the advent of each new idea and oppose more or less openly her free and fearless ways she saw herself as an automaton who droned don'ts monotonously whenever any one pulled its string or poked it with an inquiring finger in her imagination she conjured up the figure she thought she must now be in asia's eyes a sort of demon of caution enclosed in a wet blanket with ominous arms pointing ever to disaster she exaggerated its forbidding aspects till it became a frankenstein she went over the things that she and asia had talked about in the last few weeks the garden the weather a summer cover for her new bedroom chair her new clothes the sunsets and meaningless gossip about people in auckland and at the bay she saw now that only bitter personal experience had brought her to realize the truth of mrs brayton's words spoken years before in the throes of a momentous experience torn by doubts and indecisions as her mother knew she must have been asia had chattered to her of flowers and the weather she began to wonder what she really was now to david bruce how could he love her if she was now what she seemed to herself to be what had kept his affection the warm and beautiful thing it had been did she know him she had been stunned the night before to think he would do the infamous things he said he had done if she did not know david bruce whom or what in the world did she know she asked herself what she was now to believe she saw she would have to take stock again of her faith could she believe that a thing that bruce would do was wrong if she did believe it was wrong what was to be her attitude towards him if she did not condemn him for doing wrong things could she condemn anybody else how did one judge what constituted the special case were asia and ross to be classified under that heading and supposing it really was certain that they would never be found out would she be so disturbed about their wrongdoing then further would she not even be prepared to tolerate an action that would prevent their being found out no never she told herself and then again yes through all this torture of indecision she wanted passionately to do the right thing she prayed that she might not settle into indifference into the easiest way though she no longer prayed to gods who were abstractions in the sky she cried out to something not of herself to the god in a blind 
and struggling humanity, the something that keeps it struggling in spite of the blindness. When David Bruce came to dinner, he found her in the front room beside the window. In her eyes, he read much of what she had been through, and he saw that she turned as she always had, to him for the way out. It was a minute before she saw that he, too, had been scored by the night before. Oh, I hope you did not worry about me, David, as she held out her hands to him. I thought about you. I could hardly help that. She noticed that his voice sounded tired, and that he looked as if he had not slept. She forgot herself in thinking of him. Don't worry about me, she commanded. You have all got to stop worrying about me. A smile flitted across his eyes as he caught the new note of resolution. He motioned her to sit down and took a chair near her, but he made no attempt to talk, knowing they would soon be interrupted. They both sat looking at each other wonderingly, but with the certainty that they meant the same to each other. Bruce was still asking himself how she had kept her story from him. She was still wondering what else there was about him she did not know. But the answers would make no difference. They did not talk much at dinner, for the children were accustomed to their quiet moods, and seeing that he was tired, they thought nothing of it. Even Asia, absorbed in her own story, saw nothing unusual about their silence. The sun was setting as they walked out to the veranda and drew chairs to their favorite place behind the rose trees outside Alice's window. It had long been an accepted fact that they sat there undisturbed, unless it was by Roland, who occasionally sat there too, when he was at home. Asia had instilled into the minds of the rest of the family that the elders liked to be left alone after dinner, and it was to her training that Bruce and Alice owed much of the privacy they enjoyed, a privacy they could not have arranged for themselves without attracting attention. Bruce had wondered many times whether it had been done innocently or with design. It was one of the things he admitted he did not know, and he admired Asia the more for being clever enough to keep the knowledge from him. Soon after they settled themselves, they saw her go down past the store and along the spit to the little bridge that now spanned the channel to the other side. They watched her disappear into the bush, evidently to make her way up to the road and down to the cottage without passing through the mill grounds. Bruce expected that Alice would make some appeal for sympathy, but she did not. She continued to stare into the sunset while he filled and lit his pipe. Presently he leaned towards her. Have you decided what you're going to do? She did not move as she answered, her eyes still fixed on the sunset. I suppose I must not speak. I see it might be no good, but I don't know what to do. I still feel I ought to do something. How can I sit on here and see her go every evening, and no, and no? Her voice fell away to a whisper. My dear, he began softly. Don't you think that is just conceit? We are all such infernal egotists that we can't conceive that anything ought to go on without our assistance or resistance. We will think that we personally are so important to the march of progress, to the defeat of evil. We don't see that sometimes the best way may be the elimination of ourselves. She turned her head slowly and looked into his questioning eyes. You're right, David. That is one of the things that is the matter with me. Oh, dear, so much is the matter with me. Unexpectedly, her voice ended in a sob. He closed his hand upon her arm and smiled at her. So much is the matter with most of us. You have no monopoly over the muchness. She recovered herself. She determined to keep her mind clear of emotionalism, for there were many things she wanted to ask him. Wouldn't you tell her, David? I've always felt that if a man came into her life, she ought to know. Why? Well, it would make a difference to most men. It would make a difference to most of us if we knew everything about everybody. If we didn't have delusions about most people, we could not endure the sight of them. Considering we cannot see the whole of people, by all means, let us see as much of the pleasant side as possible, and remain in ignorance of the things that might hurt us. I'm not so grim a realist that I would not throw dust in my own eyes if I could. The trouble with me is that I can't. So I have learned to take the truth as pleasantly as may be. But the Lord forbid that I should always be ramming so uncomfortable a thing down other people's throats. I only do it to avoid what looks like something still more uncomfortable. Now why tell Asia? What good would it do to her or Ross to know? What would the knowledge save them from? It would hardly stop them doing what they want to do, which would be your chief object in telling them. But if you wouldn't tell them, David, you must think it would make a difference, she persisted. Supposing it would. I should call that a good reason for not telling them. 
if they were likely to find out from others i might think differently but they will never know unless you or i tell what right have we to drop a useless and unpleasant fact upon innocent people she looked at him without attempting to answer the right thing in cases of this kind is the kind thing and don't let the deception worry you deception is one of the kindest methods man ever used it covers up more ugly sores helps more people to fresh beginnings and sees more people into peaceful graves than anything else on earth there is hardly one of us that could afford to part with it could you could i she sat very still considering his words watching her as he puffed at his pipe he realized how much she had aged in the past week and he saw that if she could not be roused she was likely to let herself be crushed he remembered that she had not worn the brown dress since the dinner that she had appeared only in her oldest clothes he contrasted her with other women he knew who faced with disasters got some subtle comfort from their gayest gowns why don't you wear that brown dress he asked abruptly why david she began startled and then her eyes fell before his quizzical gaze you know you are acting as if there had been a death in the family when it is instead a matter of life seeking to renew itself it ought to be an occasion for gaiety yes i mean that now you wear your brown dress every second night if not every night from now on whether i'm here or not if you have decided to let them alone you may as well be pleasant about it her attempt to look shocked was a failure although she would have curbed any desire to laugh outright she could not help smiling at him but she was in no mood to be light for any length of time david i am going to leave them alone but i cannot be happy about it not even to please you he closed his hand over hers all right but you will wear the brown dress very well i will do that to please you he smiled again and patting her hand returned to his smoke after some silence she returned to her questions david you think they are making a mistake don't you she sat up straighter in her chair and looked at him with almost a judicial air why how do i know only time can decide that about any action if they win the world to respect their friendship it's a success if they don't it's a mistake we will be able to decide in ten years time but you think something she would not be put off my dear i know what you want to know you want justification for leaving them alone for perhaps helping them you want something to say aloud in the night to that conscience of yours well this is what i have learned to say long ago to mine when i am faced with a human being in a mess i am not faced with a problem of compiling rules and regulations for the whole human race for all the ages that is the thing we forget when we get off our ridiculous remarks about public morality and social order what have i to do with cumbersome abstractions when i am faced with a specific instance of the cruelty and injustice of ignorant human judgment if i were lecturing in public on morals or helping to frame a code i should talk very differently from the way i do when a girl comes to me with a prospect of a broken life hanging over her i prevent all the harm i can i've kept some girls out of it here when i knew in time and guessed they could be frightened out of going with men by a good talking to but i did not preach to those who came to me with the harm done that would have been very useful wouldn't it alice dropped her head unexpectedly into her hands oh david what a failure i have been she choked i have never helped anybody he tried to comfort her and to convince her that her self-condemnation was extreme and absurd but he returned to his shanty feeling that he had not succeeded and that she would have to work her conviction out of her system in her own way End of chapter 28chapter twenty nine of the story of a new zealand river by jane mander this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty nine alice awoke one morning a few days later with a feeling that something was in the air the first thing she remembered was that her husband was leaving early for auckland and that she must get up and pack his bag one of the few wifely duties left to her then she remembered that she had heard the girls say the night before that lynn was going by the same boat to meet a sydney friend who was on a visit to new zealand and that he would be away a week or two without waiting for asia to call her she began to dress whenever she was well she rose for breakfast if roland was leaving early to be away for any length of time along with a few things that she always did for him 
such as darning his socks and putting his clothes away she had carefully preserved certain courtesies she accompanied him to the gate when he left for more than a day or two and came to the door to meet him on his return if she was away she telegraphed to tell him the day she was coming home she continued to consult him about small purchases about which she knew he was now generous and indifferent he had never remarked upon these things nor had she she did not know whether he would have missed them if they had been left undone the whole family sat down together to breakfast which was in itself a sufficiently uncommon occurrence to brand the day as unusual when he was home roland rarely arranged his habits to suit the hour the children had to eat in order to get off in good time for school as he was either early or late he usually ate alone though when she felt like it asia took pity on his loneliness and ate with him but she never made a habit of doing so when she was away betty and mabel together shouldered the task of looking after him breakfast with him had always been a difficult and unsatisfactory affair although he was not hard to please at dinner his morning appetite was as uncertain as a choppy wind and the person who had waited on him always had a sense of failure at the end of the meal and a feeling of thankfulness when he left the table he was more than usually irritable this morning because he had not been able to find his cheque-book and a twenty minutes search on the part of the whole household had failed to locate it he swore he had not left it in the store where it was found just as he was leaving or in the bush or with david bruce so they all sat down with a disagreeable sense that they were under suspicion for gross carelessness the one person who did not really mind was asia any sort of fuss or diversion pleasant or unpleasant meant that nobody noticed her or made her more conscious of what lay ahead of her alice minded the breakfast atmosphere less than she usually did once she would have allowed the pressure of her husband's irritability to weigh upon her now it struck her as being trifling and unreal what did a lost cheque-book matter the scene moved before her as if she were looking at a picture she felt an extraordinary detachment as she watched the members of her family tom roland fussing every few minutes about his book betty and mabel hurrying nervously because they were a little late bunty subdued and sulky because his father had accused him of mislaying the lost property elsie meek and silent because she shrank into herself in an uncongenial atmosphere and asia the most unreal of them all outwardly calm and managing trying as she always did in such scenes to pour oil upon the troubled waters that two streams of events the known and the unknown could flow together under the same roof in the manner they were doing before her eyes seemed to be incredible she saw they were all mysteries to each other she began to wonder what kept them together whether anything ought to keep them together whether the bond were not the most artificial of ties and speculating about it she ate more composedly than any one else though she did not dare to scrutinize asia she was aware of her poise of her apparent elimination of herself and she wondered how she could possibly be so normal with such a personal crisis hanging over her head an hour later alice sat on the front veranda to watch tom roland and david bruce leave in the launch she followed them till she saw them stop at a point below the mill where two men got on board that puzzled her till she guessed that ross would accompany lynn to point curtis and then return with bruce but when she saw the boat coming up river again there was only one person in it and it did not stop anywhere it was not till the afternoon that she saw that this was part of a plan arranged beforehand she stayed out all morning making a pretense of gardening in the shade she heard asia humming and whistling as she worked inside and wondered if she were doing it to keep her courage up or to impress her mother or whether it were the spontaneous outflow of real happiness alice felt no anger now against the lovers though she would still have stopped them if she had believed she safely could she had made up her mind to be blind she was now like a puppet she would not move till they moved and when they pulled the string she would dance to their tune not enthusiastically or energetically but still she would dance at lunch-time she managed to be more normal than she had expected she could be and the quiet meal with mabel and the children was such a contrast to the restless breakfast that both she and asia remarked upon it with smiles but they both avoided looking directly at each other and each hoped the other did not notice asia remembered vividly afterwards that her mother was pathetically gentle and soft and that she had looked a great deal out of the window they were helped to keep up by mabel who was in a vivacious mood and talked of what she had to do for the school concert and picnic that was soon to close the term 
and inaugurate the summer holidays after lunch alice lay down for an hour but she could not even doze with the suspense hanging over her she had to make an effort to stay in her room for the time she usually spent there then she took some sewing to the eastern veranda and sat down facing the village and pukikaroro but she could not sew her hands fell limply into her lap while she stared vacantly at one thing and another moving about the bay she saw women taking in their washing from the yards she saw two men lazily fixing something on the tramway under the hot sun she followed a rider down the road beside the line until he disappeared behind a low rise beyond the kitchen she saw him reappear on the crest of the slope and ride slowly to the stables and dismount although she saw men ride thus every day she wondered idly who he was she heard the children screaming through their afternoon recess in the school grounds and the noise of hammers about the boat shed on the spit and as a background for these sounds the mill its belts and saws and chains once when a truckload of logs broke from the bush near the base of pukikaroro she roused herself to a keener attention it seemed to her it was coming too quickly she had learned to know the different kinds of roar made by the load coming fast or slow and she always listened in some anxiety for some of the worst accidents had occurred at the curve at the foot of the hill to men driving carelessly which she saw she had anticipated as usual the trucks disappeared behind the rise only to come merrily on across the flat and be braked to a standstill beside the booms alice wondered how everything could be going on just the same it seemed to her incredible that nothing should be altered there now that she had seen something of what went on below the surface she wondered if any other mother there were facing the tragedy of seeing a child plunge into uncertainties after four o'clock she heard steps through the house and the front gate click stung to wide awakeness she swung her chair round she saw asia go down the path to the store but she was still wearing the blue print dress she had worn that morning and she went hatless with nothing in her hands presently she returned laden with packages groceries instead of taking them straight inside she came round the veranda to her mother she was breathless apparently from hurrying up the hill mother a man has just come up from a new family below point curtis to ask for help his wife is very ill i said i'd go she said it so naturally that for the moment alice believed her oh dear she raised her face from her sewing who is it asia did not hesitate as she looked into her mother's eyes and down at the slipping package haywood he said the name was uncle david said i could tell what it was and send for him if necessary oh yes alice bent over her sewing with a curious feeling of perplexity mother if it was typhoid or pneumonia or anything like that i might stay for a few days you can get mrs north or eliza king there won't be very much to do i did some cooking this morning then alice saw she ran her needle into her finger and leaned down while she put it in her mouth prepared though she thought she would be to meet the trial when it came she felt a rush of pain through her body but she was able to answer in a voice that did not betray her state of mind certainly you must stay as long as they need you something in her rose to play the game you will need some old linen and you had better take some jelly i'll get it she got up quickly dropping her sewing in the chair she felt she had to move to do something asia turned with her walking a little ahead her face was flushed and she could not look at her mother she kept arranging the packages under her arm as if it were difficult to carry them now don't do any work mother there's no necessity she began as they entered the hall oh asia will you cease worrying about me i-i really i can look after myself asia was arrested by the irritation in her mother's voice and she was misled by her manner into thinking she suspected nothing it had the effect of diverting her for the moment and clearing the air between them she really thought her mother had become more independent and that she now disliked being fussed over oh all right she answered in a tone meant to placate and walked on to the kitchen inside her room alice pressed her fingers into her temples to ward off the blackness that swept before her eyes she took up her smelling salts which helped her to steady herself mechanically she began to look for old linen with a reactionary feeling that she need not have gone so far in aiding and abetting the lovers but she made up the bundle and taking it to the kitchen she found two pots of jelly and placed them with it on the table calling out where she had left them she returned to the veranda praying that asia would get ready and go quickly she hoped this would be one of the times when mabel and the children would go up the kaiwaka road to meet betty 
and that it would be over before they got home. About a quarter of an hour later she heard Asia come to the front door, put something down, and come on round the veranda. As she turned the corner Alice saw that she had changed into her plain old navy suit, and that her hair was neatly arranged under a sailor hat. She was dressed and looked exactly as she always did when she went on such visits as the one she had described. Alice dared not look directly at her, but she was stupidly conscious of her carefully quiet manner and her extraordinary poise. Stealing herself, she was determined to be equally calm. I hope you won't find it very serious. She looked past Asia's face, pretending to be attracted by something on her hat. I hope not. Asia could not elaborate the statement. Cool though she appeared to be, she was inwardly seething with emotion, and anxious to get away as soon as possible, without seeming too abrupt. Good-bye, mother. Don't garden in the sun, and don't bother cooking hot meals for the children. Give them cold stuff till I get back. This further solicitude almost upset Alice. She dared not speak. She merely nodded her head as she put out her cheek for Asia to kiss. The caress was one of the most perfunctory they had ever bestowed upon each other. Hardened by the dread of reaction, neither of them dared to make even a show of affection. Without another word, Asia turned quickly and disappeared round the veranda. Alice stood in a daze, watching her go down the path. She saw that she carried a light straw case, and that she walked, as she always walked, with a free swinging stride. Just before she reached the blacksmith's shop, she turned round, and seeing her mother looking after her, she waved her hand. Tears gushed from Alice's eyes as she waved back. That the familiar greeting should not have been forgotten in that tragic moment touched her to the core. She began to sob, and sobbing, walked inside to her room. She did not want Asia to think she was watching, to see where she went. She saw her cross the spit bridge and enter the bush at the accustomed place. She did not know that once she was alone out of sight among the ferns and trees, Asia sat down on her case and shed sad tears, not on account of anything ahead of her, but of sorrow for that she had left behind. Alice stood staring into the bush for some time before she felt the death-like stillness of the house creeping upon her like some ghostly invisible presence. She tried to put it out of her mind. She told herself the house was just the same, that the children would soon be home, that everything was as it was that morning. But an incurable restlessness seized her. She went out into the hall, meaning to go outside, but instead something drew her to Asia's room. As she looked round it she could not see that a thing had been changed. There was no sign that its owner had departed in a fever of unrest. Flowers freshly cut the day before filled several vases. The windows were open and the blinds fixed, to let in the sun and breeze. The evidences of Asia's taste and individuality impressed her as if she were seeing them for the first time. She looked round at the pictures, the furniture, the books, the ornaments. She began to wonder why she had always associated certain material things with certain modes of thought, certain ways of living, as if one would commit murder or not, according to the kind of furniture one owned, be immoral or not according to one's taste in color and line. She had expected to feel in Asia's room as if she had seen her coffin carried out of it, but there was something so reassuring about its sunshiny freshness that she could not cry. She walked to the window looking out upon the river to lower the blind, as the sun was streaming straight in. Her eye caught the light sparkling from a bit of the zinc roof of the cottage across the river. It fascinated her. She wondered if Asia had reached it. Then she saw she had no business to follow her there, no business to try to visualize the lovers, no right even to think about them. As she turned back into the room she wondered what clothes Asia had taken with her. On a sudden impulse she turned the handle of her cupboard to find it locked. She tried the drawers of the bureau. They too were locked. It was the first time as far as she knew that any of her girls had locked up their things, for she had taught them such respect for each other's property as to make the precaution unnecessary and she had never heard that the trust had been abused. It struck her with the force of a blow that she was the person Asia had suspected, and there she stood convicted. And although Asia would never know that she had spied, she had believed that she might, and she was right. Hot from head to foot with humiliation, she hurried from the room out into the garden, and, unseeing, along the back path, among the vegetables. There were mean things in her life of which she was ashamed, things she could not bear to think about, but she had never felt worse about anything than she did then. 
her self-condemnation roused her out of the insensibility she had been cultivating for days to a determination to redeem herself in her own eyes to redeem herself not by passivity but by something positive both in attitude of mind and action with her eyes hard and bright she made a contract with her soul that henceforth she would be no man's judge and the censor of no one save herself mechanically she stooped down and pulled a little clump of weeds from a carrot bed when she raised herself she saw betty and mabel and the children coming along the path behind the cottages she hurried inside to get tea ready for them when she opened the cupboards she saw that asia had cooked a stock of food to last for several days she wondered why she was surprised and touched at this further evidence of consideration she saw she had been supposing that Asia's whole character would be altered because she had chosen to do one thing forbidden by the conventions. At tea she told the girls that Asia had been called away to a sick family. As this had happened before, they asked no inconvenient questions, nor did a suspicion enter their minds. In answer to a question, Alice told them they could not under any circumstances call upon Ross in Lynn's absence, and she forbade Bunty to cross the river or go near the mill till his father returned. After tea, as Alice went to her room to change, she remembered that it was the turn of the brown dress. She knew she had to wear it, for David Bruce was coming to dinner, but almost guiltily she took it out and laid it on the bed and looked at it. To wear her best finery on such an occasion looked at first like sacrilege to her. Then she told herself it was part of playing the game she had determined to play. Still, it was not without a few regretful tears, tears for the pity of it all, that she put it on. However, when she looked at herself later in the glass, she felt a little glow of triumph that she had so far conquered herself as to keep up appearances in that manner. She rose on the front veranda as David Bruce came up to the gate. He kept his eyes upon her as he entered and mounted the steps. Without a word he took her hands, held her off at arm's length, and looked at her. She saw by his eyes, where laughter and the mistiness of tears were mingled, that he understood the criss-cross of her emotions and decisions and her feeling about the dress, and that he knew what the day had meant to her. It was not till they were in the sitting-room that she turned to him with the words that had been on her tongue as he came up the path. You know she has gone to him, David? Yes, I know. That was all they said about it before dinner. End of chapter 29this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 30 The autumn set in late, after the unusually hot summer, remembered afterwards as one of the worst for fires that the North had ever known. For two months Tom Rowland kept bands of fighters ready for any emergency, and he was fortunate in escaping with nothing worse than some bad scares, two small burns, and the loss of one camp outfit. For weeks at a time the pall of smoke, rolling up from the fires started on the gum fields in the clearings and on wastelands obliterated the horizons the low scrub-covered ground opposite the mill inside the turn of the river below roland's house had blazed for one week raising showers of sparks that were watched anxiously lest they should carry across the smoke from this section filled the houses about the bay so that everybody tasted it on their tongues when they woke in the morning there had been one weird period of several days when the late afternoon sun had seemed to step out of the great curtain behind it and to be rapidly approaching the earth with the awful ominousness of some bulging blood-red eye in a monster mad with the lust for wholesale destruction men stopped work to look at it and women shivered as with a presentiment of evil its appearance was so extraordinary that the newspapers sought to find causes for it and concluded that the huge fires going on in australia at the same time accounted for the phenomenon as she sat much alone alice felt there was some correspondence between the behaviour of the seasons and the happenings in her own little world it seemed fitting to her that that particular summer and autumn should be out of the ordinary the constant anxiety about fire on the part of her husband and david bruce paralleled her restlessness those abnormal suns intensified the sense of unreality she had had about her life since the day she knew that asia and ellen ross had begun to live together it was not until more than two months of the relation had gone by that she began to accept it as something more than an excrescence on her experience then it began to fit in to flow with other things in her daily life 
she had managed to be so noncommittal after asia's first return that they had both started without embarrassment upon the course they had since pursued alice had accepted without question the tale asia told about the haywoods she met ross at tea two days later taking her cue from the normal behaviour of the lovers as time went on she had had relapses into amazement at their unruffled demeanour moments of fear that they might be discovered short periods of envy for their youth and courage every kind of ebb and flow of emotion and decision about them but all through she had outwardly preserved a serenity that completely deceived them and that was praised as wonderful by david bruce the lovers had been most discreet ross had come alone or with lynn to dinner many times he had never betrayed himself nor had asia they had not shut themselves up to each other they had joined in trips to the bush in firefighting expeditions in parties of various kinds when they had gone alone in the launch up the river they arranged their start so that they were not seen leaving together ross always waited at or near the dell when they went sailing down the river lynn accompanied them so far and landing below the gap walked back through the bush bruce assured alice that they might go on for a year like that and that no one would suspect if roland thought anything about them he never mentioned it this elimination of immediate danger affected alice she saw that it was bringing her to think differently of their action she found herself wondering if after all the spiritual values they got did not justify them she usually fell back from heresies of this kind into questions as to where it would end if everybody did as they were doing but she watched them as much as she dared with interest and sometimes with fascination one night towards the end of march she felt her loneliness and restlessness more than usual it was the brown dress night and she had almost come to believe that it had an uncanny influence over her as she would have expressed it it gave her the fidgets if she had been a different type of woman she would have said it made her feel naughty wicked or like the devil but though she had heard such expressions on the mischievous lips of dory harding it never occurred to her to use them even in fun she had dressed carefully knowing that ross was coming to dinner and hoping that bruce would get down from the bush but his failure to appear put a note of disappointment into the meal which seemed to her to have been unsatisfactory to the lovers also because roland who was in a garrulous mood monopolized the conversation with tedious repetitions of his fire-fighting exploits she thought asia and ross were unusually quiet she knew that ross was soon to return to sydney and she rightly guessed that they hated to think that that summer of romance had to end as she saw them go off together afterwards she could not help feeling sorry for them seeing the inevitable changes they had to face after roland had departed for the evening to visit the captain of a timber ship that had arrived that afternoon alice sat down outside her window leaving her children studying as usual in the dining-room the night heavy with smoke was sultry and enervating and yet had a curious goad in it that prevented one's giving way to it with pleasant limpness there was also a haunting foreboding of winter intensified by the crickets that in keeping with the other exaggerations of the season were that year more numerous than ever they seemed to alice to chirp with a mournfulness worse than anything she had ever heard she had not sat long before they and something in the night got on her nerves getting up she walked off down the front steps and round into the back garden where she began to pace backwards and forwards along the centre path the night settled down quickly hastened by the smoke stars were visible only vaguely at the zenith she began to stop at intervals to listen for sounds that might tell of bruce's return but though the night was very still she could hear nothing that resembled a horse's hoofs down the road she could never tell afterwards what it was that drove her out of the garden and along the path to his shanty she knew that unless it was very late when he returned he would come to see her for she had not seen him at all that day although it was long after the time when she had ever gone alone in the evening to see him she felt she could not wait all that was in her mind was the idea that she would see if he were there and that if he were she would bring him back with her when she got near his shanty she paused at the sound of scrappy whistling then she saw a faint sheen of light radiating from his doorway she listened to hear if he had any one with him as she did so a shadow crossed the light and a stream of water thrown from a dish careered out into the night and splashed upon the dry earth hearing no other sounds she was reassured and went on david bruce was standing in front of his mirror adjusting a tie when he heard her step on the porch you he said i was just coming along he gave her a quick curious look 
wondering what had happened. She stood in his doorway, as if she were waiting to be asked in. I didn't hear you ride down, David. Though her voice was natural, she felt uncertain and nervous. No, I came slowly. The road is very dusty. Have you had your dinner? Yes, in the bush. Aren't you coming in? He turned from the mirror. Oh, yes. She moved forward a few steps, and then stood hesitating. As he put on his coat, he wondered again why she had come. But he treated her unusual action as if it were a common one. He left her to seat herself while he lit his lamp, blew out his candle, put away his soiled clothes, and hunted for his pipe and tobacco. Absent-mindedly, Alice sat down on his bunk watching him, and looking aimlessly about the room. Her eyes stopped at one of his windows. "'You need a new curtain, David,' she said solemnly. He surveyed the article she disapproved, as if it had been an affair of state. "'Oh, do I? I hadn't noticed.' When he had finally cleared his clothes away and collected his smoking materials on a little table, Alice stood up. "'I just came to meet you, David,' she said, as if it had suddenly dawned on her that she had to give a reason for her visit. "'Good gracious,' he smiled easily. "'Sit down. Now that we are here, we can stay here, surely.' His amused eyes helped her to lose some of her nervousness. "'What's the matter?' he went on lightly. "'Is it just the dumps or something more serious?' Seated in a chair opposite her, he smiled approvingly at the brown dress, but though his manner was airy, he was sympathetically conscious of her restlessness. He had helped her to laugh at herself many times that summer. He had brought her to shed the remainder of her stock phrases about morals. He had seen her undergo transformations as the result of her clearer self-analysis, but he knew she was still a long way off peace of mind. "'I don't know what's the matter with me, David.' I'm beginning to wonder if I'm getting like these modern women who revolt against domesticity. Her troubled eyes looked into his, then over his shoulder at the wall. What? he said softly. You? A feminist? What next? Don't make fun of me, David. Do you really think my life now is a satisfactory thing? Do you? He saw she was bent on being serious, but he hoped to mitigate the intensity of her mood. Well, what do you think of doing? Do you propose to start a Browning club? or a mother's circle at the bay, or what? Then he saw he had hurt her. David, don't, please. Oh, don't mind me, my dear. Now I'm ready to listen. What's the trouble? He leaned forward. I've been thinking this summer, David, and I'm beginning to hate my useless knife. I've been asking myself what it is that I do that is any good. She paused. Yes, go on. He began to fill his pipe. I don't do anything that means anything in the house. You know that. I used to love the children all taking care of me, but now I hate it, and they will go on treating me as if I were an invalid. They turn me out of the kitchen. They fuss about my getting tired. They seem to live in dread of my headaches. Oh, David, I hate it. I hate it. I'm nothing to any of them, and it makes me so lonely. I haven't anything to do. I'm no use to Tom. I'm only half a woman to you. She stopped because his hand had closed her mouth impulsively slipping to his knees he threw his arms about her oh my dear do stop that half a woman business start a movement anything he threw up his head but before either of them could move there was a step on the porch and roland stood in the doorway his rubber shoes had not heralded his approach upon the dusty path he had a yellow piece of paper in one hand he blinked in the light from the nickel lamp caught sight of the two at the bunk and quickly drew back beg pardon he exclaimed startled I didn't mean to intrude. Alice turned white in spite of the reassuring look Bruce shot at her as he drew away from her. It was the first time in all their experience that Roland had come upon them in anything like a compromising situation. You're not intruding, Bruce said, getting to his feet. Come in, Tom. It's all right, muttered the boss. I'll do it in the morning. No, it won't do in the morning, answered Bruce quietly. Come in. But it was obvious the boss did not want to. He entered uncomfortably and only when Bruce repeated the words almost as a command. He crumpled up the paper in his hand, bit his lip, and stared at the floor. Tom, this looks bad. His partner looked straight at him, speaking with significant slowness. And I'm afraid you won't believe me when I say that your wife have never been unfaithful to you in the conventional sense. As Roland looked up, Bruce saw incredulity in his eyes, but not the anger he had expected to see. Well, then, you're a mighty strange pair, was his blunt reply. At these words Alice rose mechanically from the bunk. She, too, was amazedly conscious that he was not angry. "'I don't understand you,' said Bruce. 
do you mean you've never made love to my wife tom roland stared at him as if his not doing so was a matter for investigation i mean that certainly you don't love her that is another story answered bruce in the same calm tones you love her and you expect me to believe that you haven't made love to her roland stared again at him as if he were the sensational novelty at a circus that is the truth and the boss saw it well i'm jiggered he muttered looking at the floor again alice dropped back onto the bunk struggling for breath even bruce could not at once see the significance of it do you mean you have supposed your wife and i were lovers he asked after a moment of dead silence yes for how long oh i don't know exactly the boss bit his lips again and kicked at the end of a rug ever since you spoke to me about her anyway what exclaimed bruce raising a hand at alice who had turned to him in astonishment well what else could i think the boss looked up with a simple air of inquiry god exploded bruce look here tom you have the morals of a barnyard but have you never met a man who could keep his hands off a woman precious few and there was something wrong with them retorted the boss grimly good god man there is some decency in the world i've been in the position of trust what the devil do you mean by thinking i would abuse your confidence in that way alice felt the world turning round her as she saw the two men face each other without hostility without anger with nothing but amazement in their eyes the boss was the first to lower his well i thought you'd see i was giving you chances giving me chances repeated bruce yes spluttered tom roland i'd had mine and failed i came to see i wasn't her style never would be and i knew you were and i owed you a lot his voice cracked but he went on brokenly i thought about it i had always done what i damn well pleased i thought i could give you a turn i wasn't in a position to judge anybody and when you spoke about her health i thought that was what you wanted and that it was up to me to let you alone i knew she didn't love me i don't think she ever did it was just hard luck his voice broke and bursting into hysterical sobs he dropped into a chair as she listened to him alice got up to her feet again and she stood staring at him her throat dry and burning and tears running unheeded down her cheeks she did not know why she was crying she felt as if she were in a dream bruce also looked at him as if they were all puppets in a show roland's words were as much a revelation to him as they were to alice he could hardly credit that the man he had worked with for years could have kept a thing like this from him when he recovered his full consciousness he stepped to the chair and put his hand on the boss's shoulder tom get up he said hoarsely controlling himself with an effort roland scrambled to his feet and the two men looked at each other again ignoring alice who stared stupidly from one to the other you were willing to let your wife and me be lovers said bruce slowly after i'd thought about it yes and i stayed away a lot and never came back without notice and now you tell me you never saw it he felt that the one great magnanimous thing he had ever done his secret pride for three years had been thrown away bruce saw he held out his hand tom i don't know what to say to you most uncomfortably the boss took it wishing himself out of this then for the first time he took notice of the presence of his wife do you want a divorce you could get plenty of evidence these words shot at her startled her out of her daze she jumped put out her hand searching for something to hold on to and turned beseechingly to bruce but he did not look at her instead he walked to the door leaned against it and stared out into the night roland looked impatiently at his wife wondering why she did not answer you must know by this time whether you want it or not he said if you do i'll give you no trouble i've lived on and off with mrs lyman for years she'd make no fuss she'd like to marry me alice felt as if she would choke words strained painfully out of her throat were strangled at birth she turned agonized eyes on bruce but he never gave a sign her lips moved like those of a paralytic what asked roland unable to hear do you want the divorce bruce only just heard her question there was a short pause in which the room was as still as a vacuum the boss fidgeted his hands working nervously i can't say that i do he mumbled don't you want to marry mrs lyman her voice was a little stronger not particularly you have lived with her on and off for years and you don't want to marry her she asked not understanding he mistook the meaning of her tone well that ain't remarkable he snapped 
lots of men live with women they don't want to marry why don't you learn something about the world you're living in you saints you don't know what goes on under your nose i'm no worse than other men i'm not half as bad as some of them that you've met and been very pleasant to if you know more about life you wouldn't condemn me i'm not condemning you cried alice passionately her face set in an effort at control but she could not help herself she sat down on the bunk and burst into tears oh for god's sake he exclaimed impatiently he hated any scenes he did not make himself and he wondered why on earth they had all got into this his tone stiffened alice she pulled herself up and rising faced him again do you want things to go on as they are yes i suppose i'd prefer it he answered truthfully i don't hanker after any scandal but i'm willing to go through with it if you want me to he kicked again at the rug as she looked at his lowered face and nervous movements alice grew steady with resolution i will not get the divorce unless you wish it her voice rang round the shanty she fancied she saw bruce move in the doorway her husband did not realize what that decision cost her nor did he regard it as final you don't have to decide it tonight. you can talk it over you can live with each other anyway all you want to as far as i'm concerned he swung round as if he'd done with it alice stood frozen dry-eyed looking from him to the man in the doorway bruce turned as the boss stumbled towards him tom he began hoarsely roland raised a twitching distressed face i hope you don't think i did things for you with this in view holy moses exclaimed the boss with an impatient gesture do you think i don't know better than that that's why i'm willing here i don't want to talk any more about it but what you two do in the future is no business of mine you know what i've been and you've never preached to me well i'm grateful i'll agree to anything you want to do only settle it soon i hate suspense he moved towards the porch with only one desire to get away from this emotional strain bruce caught sight of the crumpled yellow paper still in his hand you wanted to see me he said diverted by it what jerked the boss you came to see me about something he pointed to the paper oh yes roland was instantly relieved to come down to the comfortable subject of business his manner brightened the colliery timber company has telegraphed urgent to know how soon we can have a quarter of a million feet ready to ship to australia but i'll see you about it in the morning fortified by this break he looked back more cheerfully at alice now i don't want to chew this over i've said all i want to say for god's sake don't be tragic about it i'm not blaming you or anybody and with that he left them with the world turning dizzily around her alice dropped back onto the bunk for a minute or two while roland's rapid steps grew more and more muffled in the dust she was unconscious even of bruce's presence she felt absolutely vacant as if her whole mind had been swept clean of its contents her eyes were turned in the direction of the doorway but it was some minutes before the still figure leaning there took form and meaning then its continued silence seems to charge it with significance with her eyes glued upon him she remembered that she had refused the divorce and that she had not seen his face since she had done so david she called sharply feeling herself grow sick with the fear that he would misunderstand her he turned at once and to her amazement she saw that there was a smile a smile that screwed up his eyes on his face as he came towards her stupidly she saw him drop into his chair and stretch out his legs then he looked straight at her there seems to have been an awful waste of good virtue somewhere doesn't there he drawled she looked at him as if she had not heard him aright she could not understand why his eyes held that expression you think it's funny she exclaimed yes my dear i think it's one of the most humorous things i've ever known and one of the most pathetic then it dawned upon her that he was seeing things in the situation she did not see and that what was tremendous to her was merely incidental to him she had not begun to think of her husband or his attitude she had thought first of herself and bruce and how they might be affected by this new element in their situation she saw that he did not seem to be taking seriously the fact that roland had offered them the chance of a divorce and that she had refused it his power to remain undisturbed by such an emotion-raising proposition astonished her she suspected that for some reason best known to himself he was bluffing i couldn't ask him for a divorce david not so long as he wanted me for anything at all her eyes searched his hungrily for the corroboration she wanted that is right for you he said quietly his use of the pronoun puzzled her 
he saw that it added to the questions crowding upon her mind and to the look of distraction in her eyes seeing clearly himself that nothing would in the end be altered by roland's liberality he meant to keep her as unemotional as he could i mean that he went on as if he were discussing some simple matter you had to act as you felt i understand perfectly why you feel as you do now you have decided that let it alone but he knew that she could not and would not dismiss it as easily as all that he wondered how long it would take her to come to the alternative which to his thinking was a much more complex and difficult thing to dispose of and though he knew her well enough to be sure even then what her final decision would be he knew she would not reach it without a dovetailing of desires and prohibitions that would bring upon her another period of mental torture he was pretty sure that nothing that he could say would prevent that period of suspended resolution he watched her as she sat uncomfortably perched on the edge of his bunk her face lowered her eyes fixed on something on the rug her hands were gripped in her lap she looked singularly young her cheeks were flushed contrasting vividly with the white skin of her neck and forehead her graceful figure gave no sign of age after all she was only forty-three and in spite of all that she had gone through her inherited vitality had triumphed and had brought her to the master years crowned with an attractiveness that held all who looked upon it it was seldom that bruce allowed himself to think of the power of her physical allurement for him he had always known that if he began to make a habit of that he would have to go away he knew she was not conscious of the amount of physical quality there was in any man's feeling for a woman he knew she would have denied the amount of it in her feeling for him he had wondered lately if she recognized the source of much of her recent restlessness if she would admit it frankly when she surmised it he guessed that roland's words would bring her to realize it in some degree he was curiously impersonal in his speculation about her as if it were some man other than himself who was affected he was helped to this detachment by his amazement at an interest in roland's behavior which had astonished him more than anything had astonished him for years as she sat alice felt his eyes upon her for some time she tried to resist their clutching reach she tried to think she tried to drag some definite statement from the blur of words that travelled with the speed of an electric fan through her brain at last she got something the memory of her husband's permission to live with bruce and once she got that there was no room in her mind for anything else when at last she could no longer resist bruce's scrutiny and when she had raised her face he saw that she had come to the alternative the gripping questioning look that passed between them was a strange one to happen between two people who had been as intimate as they had been for years only for a second did bruce allow anything of his physical hunger for her to show in his eyes but short though that revelation was it stirred her to hot confusion he shut down at once on his own feeling seeing that she would need his help to find herself in this new struggle drawing himself up in his chair he leaned forward while she gazed at him fascinated well he has given you something to think about he began quietly but you do not have to do all the thinking tonight you know his impersonal manner amazed her david she burst out he said we could live together she said it as if she thought he did not realize it he smiled does his saying so settle it then she saw that in this first stage of her reaction she had actually thought that it might she did not answer but dropped her face this is something you have to decide he went on he saw her lips moving in a pitiful attempt to say something what is it he asked gently you would like me to live with you david she did not look up as he drew himself up again she raised her eyes full of storm and stress she was surprised to see that he appeared to be calm look here he began in level tones you are not to allow what you know to be my desires unduly to influence you there are times when a man's desires would make a prostitute of any woman i want you to understand now that i will not have you at any time as a sacrifice as a compromise as anything that is not spontaneous and happy if you ever come to me you will come to me as asia went to ross and in no other way unconsciously he had raised his voice and the words rang round the room he went on with her eyes glued on his face you will have to think about it and i cannot help you you know how i feel but you have to decide on your own feeling as well as mine and your feeling is something i have no right to force and please remember that until you decide there must be no playing with our emotions we have to go on as we have been doing 
it will be hard now that the possibility of change has come on us like this i have not lost anything by growing older and you know you have been growing younger lately as he talked her eyes had lit up with fire she threw out her hands to him oh david i love you and i want to do what you want i dare say he coolly ignored her hands but i won't have you that way she shrank back hurt that he had taken no notice of her impulsive gesture but she knew he was right she knew her cry was the cry of a creature desiring the mate it had chosen the primitive hunger for the pleasure in sight that takes no thought of the uncomfortable reactions that may come to-morrow then she was fired with admiration for the man who knew her better than she knew herself and who would not take advantage of her lapses oh david her lips trembled i want to love you i don't know whether i can but i want to she looked as if she were about to move forward into his arms but she stiffened herself up david bruce rose to his feet my dear i want you to go home i am likely to become irresponsible if you stay much longer now this is going to be the devil for both of us tom's words have removed one of my strongest incentives to virtue and if you begin to be shaky and to talk of your wants well he made a comical gesture of helplessness again his light tone helped her she stood up but she could not dispose of her emotions as easily as he could david i don't know what to do she began helplessly you don't have to know to-night my dear you can't settle things of this kind in an hour it will take you weeks months one day you will tell yourself that you can come to me and the next you will know that you can't and you will have to fight it out alone the one thing you must not do is to talk about it to me it's a queer situation to come up between us now i wish you would take my word for the end of it but you won't what do you mean david she asked calmed by his positive words he looked at her with an inscrutable smile in his eyes you can't do it he said but the subtle perversity that sleeps in human beings till the prick of opposition stirs it to life woke in her at the prod of his words she flashed a look at him that was almost a declaration that she would it was the primitive provocative feminine again recognizing it she flushed and turned her face away come on home he said quietly she followed him out with a queer feeling that it was all a dream that she would wake presently and be in a familiar world again they were halfway along the path before he spoke think about tom a little he said i can't get him out of my head and i don't believe you've thought about him then she saw that she had not at the back gate he took her hand raising it to his lips my dear i'd rather you did not think about this than worry remember i love you i shall go on loving you whatever you decide i don't expect you to do what other people can do you can only be yourself i shall be in the bush for a day or two try to say something to tom praise him a bit if you can do it without being upset write him a letter if you can't say it resting his head on her shoulder for a minute he kissed her forehead then he turned and walked quickly back along the path alice did not know why she began to cry or why she cried on till she stopped from sheer exhaustion when she got into bed she began to cry again and she cried without thinking until she fell asleep End of chapter 30